Whoa. I'll wait for you, Ray. Look at that. <laughs> so call to, call to order at 6 o'clock. 603. 603, Rodney says. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay, there are no adjustments to the agenda. No. Well, actually, there could be one. 10-2, uh, the discussion item was missed. Sorry, not 10-2, I apologize. The, um, the board goals, they got listed under possible action, but it didn't get listed under discussion. And I'm thinking you'll want to discuss it. Yeah. So, so 10.3, mm -hmm. we're going to have board yeah. goals? Yes, I apologize. Okay. All right, 10 there we go. All right, so Consent agenda, approve the minutes of Tuesday, September 27th, which is a regular meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All right, hearing none, so moved. Um, minutes of Thursday, October 20th, which was the special retreat. You don't have those yet. I'm working on them. Um, we don't have minutes to approve for that yet, so we will move those on to the next meeting. Uh, is there any board correspondence and communications that we need to add in, Jamie? Um, just to add a quick encouragement to everybody about the bullet points we've been sending out about the Lincoln letter. If uh, everybody can just encourage their board. We sent it home in our Thursday packet at our side. Um, just so that, and we've got a couple parents lined up to send letters as well, but the more we can encourage uh, participation in this, excuse me, um, the better the effect when we show up at that hearing um, and they really see that there's some groundswell against this union. So uh, just if you can please, if you haven't already, please spread that. And if you need it again, please let people know. Yes, and we will for sure get it to you. Thank you. All right. Do we have any public comments? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not yet? All right. This is our public comment time oh, of the meeting. I'm just, I'm just here to listen and say I support the school board and um, just oh. happy to be part of it. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody online? We have Simon P Pod. Simon, do you have any public comment? And then we also have an unknown caller on. Are they on by phone, Ray, or? No, they're joined in the meeting. Okay. All right. Well, so we don't have a quorum because of Andrew just left. There he oh, is. He just came back. Oh, there, there he is. Okay. Okay. So hearing no public comments, um, <laughs> reports to the board. Uh, Jamie. So you have my report in hand. Um, I tried to embed some links in my report uh, more often than I normally do. It, it's just to provide you more information, examples of the work we're doing. I hope you find them helpful. I didn't want them to be like additional documents that I think sometimes can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Plus some of them are like linked to our website. So um, it's just starting to demonstrate some student learning that's personalized, that meets our goal number two around personalized learnings and pathways. Um, also, I embedded a link talking about the change in the uh, summative, uh, state summative assessment and accountability measure moving from the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. I put a letter out about that as well, um, and I embedded that letter just in the event that you missed it. We always try to share my public letters with you before they go out. But it's just, again, a reminder that that's happening. We expected the embargo to be lifted on that. Hopefully by now, it still has not. The Agency of Education is still yet to lift the embargo on our spring results. I'm hopeful that that's going to happen this week um, and that you'll still get those in your November board meetings, track my progress and the uh, state summit of results. Why would they hold that up? Um, COVID, possibly. Uh, and the impact of COVID on the, of the testing results, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, the other thing that I, I'm excited tonight is part of your board development series is um, 
in addition to the work that that may happen with a mentoring program that the that was discussed at the board retreat that will take up again in november and we'll talk about at local district meetings through the upcoming month mm -hmm. to get volunteers for that i was hoping in board development this year too to just give the board a deeper dive into some of the work we're doing around our multi-tiered system of supports around proficiency based learning and pathways so that as we keep talking about these overarching goals the board has a even a deeper sense of what that all means. So this is just part one tonight to give an overview to the board about the changes that have happened in statute um, around Act 173, but how that also aligns tightly with the work we're doing as a multi-tiered system of supports. And so uh, many of you haven't met Michaela Martin. Reminder that uh, Annette Rhodes was our intensive programming coordinator originally when Don left. Mm -hmm. That opened up that vacancy. We didn't fill it until this year. And Annette's doing work also, it's intensive programming, uh, sorry, Michaela, intensive programming system support, because what we're realizing within our multi-tiered system of supports, you have to work at all levels. It's not just special education, it's early intervention, it's also high quality universal instruction. So Michaela and Annette and Onda work really closely together as a three-person team. And we are in buildings on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, doing uh, classroom observation and rounds as an administrative team and working with principals um, to discuss what we see. So example is we'll be at the White River Unified District Thursday morning and from 8.30 to 9.30 the principal will get to identify some areas that the staff is looking for feedback on. Mm -hmm. And then this team goes out and we are doing walkthroughs in classrooms and then debriefing that with our principals. And I could have just rained on someone's report. I apologize if I did. But it's just uh, it's a, something else that's going on that I wanted to just mention. Um, and then just a highlight. We, I, I know it doesn't seem um, maybe like a lot, but this idea of leveraging public transportation to better meet our stu students' needs to, uh, to allow them to be able to access after-school programming is, I believe, a huge issue when we think about equity and access. And so we are working hard with Tri-Valley Transit. I embedded the route. Know that that is hopefully just the beginning um, and that we're looking to be able to expand on that, the access to public transportation to better meet our kids' needs. Um, one of the ones that we didn't get this year that I was really hopeful for was a late bus from Rochester up to Granville Hancock. Mm -hmm. I've talked to both of those boards about it. It didn't fit in their route right now, but they heard this need and are hopeful that they're gonna be able to meet that need in the future. Wow. Um, and so that would allow our students from Granville Hancock to access after school programming and then have a late bus that gets them up to designated locations after five for our families. So I'll take any additional questions folks may have. You've heard a lot about Lincoln. A reminder to the board that we will be going back to the state board in November. Uh, Tara worked with uh, uh, her fellow colleagues at the Central Vermont Supervisory Union and at um, the Mount Abraham Unified Union School District. Business managers met here Friday to uh, further work on contingency budgets and to better strengthen the numbers that we had around uh, budget and finance. So we'll have that those details prior to the state board meeting as well um, for that November 16th meeting. And I'll take any questions folks have. So um, have you heard the cool cats and are they cool? <laughs> Thanks. I, I have heard the cool cats and actually the cool cats, this is part of the podcast that I uh, embedded in my report. The cool cats led uh, their student-led assembly on Friday morning at the White River Valley High School, uh, where, where students were uh, acknowledged for being green, which is a whole piece of the high school acknowledgement system uh, that's tied to lead them up, and the Cool Cats led that. So I have seen the Cool Cats, I've listened to the Cool Cats podcast, and seen them um, in person. I got a phone. Oh, that's cool. Right. Oh. <laughs> I think it's the last paragraph. There yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I keep I those it. links going, yeah. coming. Yeah. That's awesome. I missed that. I'll look for that. Okay. Any questions for Jamie before I move on? Can I just say it's really good to be here in person, if you can be. I like to talk person to person. We're pretty cool cats to hang out with, too. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Um, Anda, Chief Academic Officer, we are ready for your report. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have one quick other thing. Oh. Oh, I, I'll be really quick on that. We had applied, the SU had worked with um, Twin Rivers Ottaquichi Group, which services Sharon and Stratford uh, within the WRVSU. And uh, part of the work that was happening at the SU Energy Committee, which we got to get back up and running again, it's kind of fallen off, but it, the work didn't fall off behind it, um, is we applied for a grant. Uh, for a possible uh, federal funds for three electronic electric buses and all the work that would go into supporting electric vehicles. And there was support um, by Jeff Martin, who leads that initiative for Two Rivers to pursue that grant. We will find out very soon whether we were recipients. That grant money, the buses are bought, paid for, and all the, all the work that goes into servicing those buses is paid for and it would follow us from if we were to like for example we're going out to bid on uh busing here in the next couple months tara will talk about that and update you that with it in her, her report the rfp's up those buses don't go to butlers they would stay with the su and go to the new contractor if we were to receive the grant so just stay tuned i had mentioned it way back in the spring at one point and that we will find out soon whether or not we were recipients. Thank you. Okay. All right, Anda, now it's your turn. Okay, thank you. Sorry I can't be in person. We were wrapping up a first and second grade soccer season today. So. <laughs> awesome. Um, Way more fun to be at. Go for it. Go for it. You know, it's it's the best of both worlds to be able to do both these things in an evening. So um, it's hard to fit everything that's going in um, into two pages. So I'm just going to give a few highlights and uh, and then, uh, you know, I'll always give a chance for any questions or comments. Um, we will spend more time in November on the Track My Progress um, sort of benchmark assessment. We are using it sort of as a screener in the in the fall with all our students to see you know where their knowledge and skills are after uh, you know, four to four to eight weeks of instruction. Um, but I, I worry that some of when we get focused on the results that some of the other pieces can get missed. And I know that last um, last month there was question about how much time, folk, uh, you know, our students are spending on computers and assessment. And so my report there, I, we pulled what the average um, the average assessment time is, and it's just about 24 minutes. So that's, um, and you do one, you know, one assessment a day. Sometimes they are a couple of days apart. Sometimes they're a week apart. Um, but that's about what they're averaging. If we see kids sort of finish it in under 10 minutes, we wonder, you know, if they if they've um, understood all the questions and haven't skipped them. And if they're taking much much longer than that, and then we also look at that and see if we need some more accommodations. But mo you know, the vast majority of our students are finishing it, you know, between really between sort of 20 and 26 minutes. Um, and then the other piece that I think is really important is we've got some of our um, some of our educators. We're talking to students about this assessment, especially students who had taken it for the first time. And I just wanted to read a couple of quotes from those students just so you get a little bit more of a flavor of what their experience is. Uh, so one of them was. I like I like to track my progress because it was fun. I like it because it wasn't very easy and it wasn't very hard. And I feel like that that um, quote in particular really captures what a computer adaptive test is really trying to do, which is adapt to how students are doing. And when they get you know a couple of questions right, it makes the the level of those questions harder. If they hit a couple of questions that are more challenging, then it makes it a little bit easier because it's really trying to, in a limited number of questions, really try to figure out exactly sort of where their knowledge and skills are. And so we had a number of students say, you know, it was fun, it was easy and hard. And so it's really doing its job when it's done that. Um, I, it was tiring, kind of fun. I read about so many things, so, right? Just also the exposure to some other, you know, content that they may not get. Uh, this one, I felt like a YouTuber in a film. It was like playing a video game. Cool. Oh, and uh, I like the question, the test, because it was easier than Star 360. I spent like five days on Star 360. Some questions were harder than others. So again, just a, a sense of sort of what these students are, are experiencing as they go through it. When we come back together in November, both at your individual districts and at the SU, we'll have a chance to look at sort of what the results are, what we're learning about um, where students are and how it's going to impact our instruction moving forward. 
Uh, the other things I just wanted to mention, uh, especially because we've got Michaela in the room. So uh, due to her persistence in like the best possible way, we got um, invited in, um, into a national research study uh, on a piece of curriculum that we were already using in some of our um, in some of our schools that really focuses on phonemic awareness, um, which we had identified last year through a lot of our work as being a real gap, particularly in our um, kindergarten through second grade um, classrooms and just ways to, re to for kids to really focus on those important foundational reading skills. So we've got two teachers who are part of that study, um, the benefits of it of getting more access to their most recent materials, which you know we had you know the, the materials from the kind of the last version. Um, which wasn't that out of date, but um, we've got the newest stuff and they're going to be using that. Uh, and we are looking forward to learning more about um, how we can, you know, what, you know, what the impact of this is. And then, you know, if, if it's as good as we hope, then, you know, how we can spread it to more of our classrooms. Um, and then the other maybe piece to mention, uh, Jamie mentioned about the we don't have um, uh, unembargoed SBAC results. Um, but I'm sure many of you tuned into sort of news around the uh, nation's report card or the NAEP testing, uh, which was, you know, is really showing that across the nation, you know, the fourth and eighth grade students that are being tested, uh, were being tested on that last year are, are showing decreases um, and the, you know, definitely, you know, attributed to the impacts of, of COVID on schooling. Uh, at the state level, I think, um, you know, while they both went down, fourth grade was about um, even with the rest of the, with the rest of the country and eighth grade was results um, were a little bit above the rest of the country. So um, we'll again be able to dig into more of, of that in the schools that were able to take that. But I think it just I, um, share that so we are all sort of staying attuned into both what's happening nationally and, and in the state um, around these, uh, these state assessments, uh, what we might expect um, when things become unembargoed and how we might respond to it. Uh, and a lot of the actions we're taking are trying to, again, still make up for lost time and, and things that are happening, continue to happen with absences and, um, and the effects of, the, of COVID. And so you'll constantly hear sort of how we're, how we're trying to address that in, in different ways. And I think the, the work that you'll also hear from Annette and Michaela um, is really well, well timed and well positioned to help address that. Uh, and the last thing, just because it came as a question last time as well around our professional development that we're offering on the SU-wide um, half day in services, which we have five across the year. And our second one is coming up this Friday. Um, of all of the staff who are considered full-time employees and therefore, you know, work on Fridays, we have a number, um, you know, folks that don't necessarily work a 1.0 schedule. Uh, we have 90% of those who have are engaged, um, who are participating in the professional learning opportunities that we're offering. So we're really excited uh, about that. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Go ahead, Bill. And, uh, um, both you and Jamie mentioned the word embargoed. And um, so does this mean that the state has shared the test results for our SU and our district schools, but uh, you can't release the information or use or somehow, or does that mean that they are actually holding that information which is available at the state level because it would seem to me it's unfortunate um, if you had it you could be analyzing it thinking about it figuring out where are the gaps what, are, what what's the lessons learned and that sort of thing so how do you define embargoed in this in this situation about the summative assessment uh, results so the, what it, what is embargoed is the district and state level results uh, individual families received their results back in um, in June. So there are there are there is information about students that's out there. What the state has embar has has embargoed and, and they said it's embargoed until they release the annual snapshot um, is that those district and school level results. So we do. Yeah, we have information that we could use um, and we can use. We also have, you know, um, we also, you know, start assessing the students when they come in, in in September and have, you know, have stuff that's also more updated. So there is individual. We, it's not, um, it's not sitting all at the state level, but we don't, um, we don't aren't able to share that. We don't have that district and school level data that we could share out. Thank you, Anda. Mm -hmm. right. And Annette? Hello, you all have my report as well. 
um, you know, Jamie, Jamie stole some of my, my thunder. So part of um, my report was talking about um, about all of us going into into schools and how exciting that is um, to actually be in schools and um, observe students learning and be able to talk to students about their learning. Um, so we've been really busy doing that. Um, Michaela and I have been really busy, um, you know, between going into buildings um, and participating in their staff meetings um, after school to do some to do some professional development. But also, um, Onda Michaela and I have been in buildings during the day, um, kind of modeling um, what some of those non-negotiable team meetings look like. So like a targeted intensive team meeting, a, a grade level data team meeting, um, what those should look like and you know who should be attending those and kind of how to set agendas. And um, so we've been, we've been really busy doing those as well. Um, also um, tonight, Michaela and I will, will, will give you um, part one of a series um, that we're gonna do on kind of Act 173 and how it relates to MTSS, which then will go into what does MTSS look like here at the White River Valley Supervisory Union. Um, and then as the series goes on, we'll talk about even more in depth about what that looks like in our buildings. Um, and then um, I did include the link again about because it is quite lengthy about um, the new rules and regulations changes that's happening um, at the Vermont AOE level, Agency of Education level, um, around special education. Some of it is small. It's just like a slight word change here or there or a slight definition change. Um, but then there are also some bigger pieces, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight in our, in our presentation. Um, and then just the last piece is um, uh, Onda, Michaela, Mr. Kanarni and I um, met with um, our AOE coach as part of our monitoring um, series, met with our coach for the first time uh, today um, to kind of start talking about, you know, what our plan uh, will be for the year and even beyond. Um, and that plan will be aligned to our strategic plan um, that we're all, you know, drafting and looking at. Um, and so I started to draft that up. I did submit um, what we needed um, for our round of uh, selective monitoring. I haven't received any feedback on it yet, but that's already been submitted. So hopefully we'll get the, the AOK -okay check on that and we'll be all done with that part of our monitoring. Um, and then just lastly, um, just sad news about my admin assistant who went out on medical leave um, at the beginning of September. So kind of been holding down the fort um, with a couple other um, ladies here in the office who have really stepped up and I appreciate them very, very much. Mm -hmm. um, Missy Burbine and, um, and Lori Ballou who have been trying to kind of fill the shoes. I've been doing some teaching with them about kind of what, what to do and how things are done. Um, and also um, Tara and her team in the business office. Um, so we've been really trying to hold down the fort at the administrative level as well. Um, so we're um, kind of filling those shoes and, and having some help um, also. Um, but I'm excited about our first round of board series tonight um, that you'll hear in a little bit. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the MTSS non-negotiables. Yes. Okay, that's like a term like... Non-negotiables. So I, I'm not sure what anybody else is as clueless as I am, but what do you mean by <laughs> non-negotiables? Yeah, non-negotiables, meaning those are the teams and those are the meetings that have to happen. There's, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no say in if they happen or not. They're, they're non-negotiable. They have to happen. I, I would, yeah, I would say structure. Yep. So, and you hear about structure and framework tonight, I would say yes. there's some key components and principles to MTSS, like yes. meeting in data to analyze, mm -hmm. to improve mm -hmm. universal instruction, or meeting with your social emotional team members. And what that team looks like could be a little different building yes. to building, yeah. based on what we have for staffing. Um, 
but the, some of those principles around teams of teachers meeting together to talk about data yes. to inform their practice would, is mostly yeah. what it's around. It's also around um, making certain that we have distributed leadership teams yeah. in each like building. Mm -hmm. So teams of teachers meeting with principals to just decide what is their, what is their in-service plan going to be for the year mm -hmm. at the district level, meaning your building level. Right, so we have five early release days as an SU that we provide professional development, but then you have teams of teachers meeting with your principals, talking about how we're gonna plan those other nine early release days. And is it tied back to our overarching goals? Um, so I give, that gives you a few examples. Yeah, I love the example. But is this something that, that, that's uh, embedded in the um, teacher contracts that we signed, or is this a state mandate through the Agency of Education uh, and the MTSS framework that, um, so that everybody's, uh, every school system has to follow? So the framework gives guiding principles and uh, components. Yep. What we did as an SU admin team over the last two years is come together and say, what are the things we need in place to make mm -hmm. this happen? So meeting all your SU principals, SU central office staff, and what we did is came on some agreed upon components that we should see across the districts. And the makeup of those teams and how they go about it can look different, but that we, we commit that these things are critical to, in order to have an MTSS. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Anda, Michaela, and I have been going into the buildings and, and starting to help help them set those structures and who the team members are and how to set those agendas and what are the priority topics to be discussed at each particular meeting and things like that. So, yeah. so they're productive. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So you just used a term. I think I wrote it down. It was selective something. It was toward the end of what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Selective monitoring. That monitoring. was in my report. Yeah. Last month, we're in selective monitoring. That's right. Thank yes. you. I just didn't remember it. I yep. knew it. I thought I'd heard it before. I didn't remember. Thank <laughs> yes. you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Tara, business manager. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So you have my report, which outlines all the events that are happening in the business office during the month of November and a couple other updates that didn't make my report. Um, we are in the process of doing our RFP for our transportation contract and also um, for our fiscal auditors. Both of those contracts are up at the end of this year, so we'll get those out into the communities to see what we get back for responses to our RFPs. And then lastly, um, Sharon Elementary School recently qualified for the fresh fruit and vegetable grant because there was funds available. So now the child nutrition team reduces the fruit and re reduced percentage requirement to open that grant up so to additional schools. So we're in the process of getting that application completed and submitted. And then the rest of my report comes later, unless there's any questions. Any questions for Sarah? Okay. Two, one, is any other school um, eligible for those fresh food grant other than Sharon? In uh, the Rochester and Bethel have already been approved. They were in the original submissions. And on, talking about food, um, under your school food authority responsibilities, bullet two, Provision two, desk monitoring, if you could kind of fill us in about that code word. So what that is, is um, given that we are, now we are now having all students eat for free and the state of Vermont is subsidizing what normally would be paid for by families under paid lunches qualification or reduced qualification, we had to do what's called provision two which is a different type of funding mechanism that allows for us to submit claims for that extra percentage. And part of that is this will be the last year that we actually collect free and reduced applications from families. So the child nutrition team is actually auditing our applications and auditing um, our recording of students in our mealtime database, which is where we keep track of all of our students' eligibility. 
and then also our direct certification. So all of that is under audit because this will be our final year of doing those collections. Thank you. Anything else for Tara? Okay. Um, uh, Ray, Director of Technology and Communications. Kathy, thank you. As I bring up my report, um, tried to, to fit as much as I could on one page. Um, one thing I would like to add is we, within the last two weeks, got our final E-rate reimbursement for last year and our first for this year. So it tells you a bit about uh, the variability in the uh, timelines there. Um, we've heard about Cognia, right? And uh, you had a uh, an onboarding call with EduClimber uh, yesterday and our SIS vendor about uh, sorting through uh, an issue relating to attendance and how we define elementary in, in the SU, which varies mm -hmm. from building. Could be K to four, could be pre-K to five or pre-K to six, and it just uh, has presented a challenge in terms of the attendance data. But uh, I believe that's all sorted out now. <clears throat> Um, I believe I actually uh, lowballed uh, the, the number of students who have uh, uh, finished their track my progress uh, because I wasn't I didn't remember that we are not testing kindergartners in this window and on on does shaking her head yes um, so I believe the number is actually much higher than 70 percent great there's a GAO report uh, for your perusal and uh, Bill told me once before he liked the pictures, so I included another. Uh, uh, this Friday at the Half Day PD, this is uh, the, the group who uh, is uh, taking part in the teaching and instructional technology class. Are you teaching it? I am not. We have, uh, <laughs> we have an instructor from uh, South Burlington. And uh, I will actually be at the admin assistance training on our new uh, report card with the admin uh, registrars. So I would entertain any questions. Sorry, I just can't remember. Edu Climber is what? Sure. Uh, <laughs> even if so, if you remember Otis, this is a, a data dashboard. We have assessments uh, from a variety of sources, and Edu Climber will be the place where administrators, eventually teachers, see all that data in one place. Got you. Okay. And is it is it everything or is it just attendance? No, no, no. It will be everything, everything from track my progress to. Oh, okay. State assessments, mm. attendance. Did we ever see one of those? Data. Like even a sample? What we can like? share this one with you when we get it up and running. Yeah. The last one you wouldn't know one to see. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I just, <laughs> but I'd like to, I'd just be curious. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. That could be geeky. part of a board development yeah, series. Yeah, yeah, just a yeah. geeky thing, just to see what the principals are looking yeah. at when they look at a student or an absolutely. example student. That'd be really cool. Okay. Thank you. Policy committee um, reading number two. The slide policy policy committee had a meeting tonight, mm -hmm. and Sylvia was going to speak to where we're at with that policy. So we mm -hmm. talked a lot about um, what people from our different boards said, and um, there was some feeling that we people did want a way for different groups to be able to express themselves. Uh, we weren't sure about the flagpole being the right place, so we wanted some more information about that. So at our next meeting, we're going to meet with legal counsel, and Jamie's going to ask if we can have a draft of what it would look like to have a policy that included um, something like banners or something besides a flagpole to express um, different groups and what they wanted to express and to see what that would look like as another option. So we're not making any further decisions right now. We're going to wait and see what um, council suggests and what they come up with for options. Sure. Good. Council will also draft a proposed policy on what a policy could look like if there was a, a policy that supported the flying of the Vermont and United States flags so that the policy com committee could see that and how that would tie possibly to the the banner piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, the policy committee just had some direct questions about the, our legal counsel, Susan Mannion, who's an affiliate attorney with Dina Atwood, 
who had drafted this policy. They just had some specific questions, I think, around the legalities of it as well. Mm -hmm. So we're not ready. Yeah. Clearly. Good. Nice. Thank you for asking tough questions and also for taking in feedback because I think both Megan last time and uh, I know Arsad had some animated discussion about it. So I appreciate that you're working on it. Any other questions for the policy committee? All right, stay tuned for updates. Mm -hmm. um, all right, on to action items. So policy, we do have some policies to, to adopt tonight. Um, these have been approved by all the local districts already. Mm -hmm. Yep, so all of the local districts have adopted these, so it's now up to the full board. Um, so we need to act to adopt policy B35, social mm -hmm. media, and I will do a roll call vote. So could I get I move, I move that we, the WRSVU board, um, adopt policy B35 about concerning social media. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion before I call the vote? Okay. So all those in favor say aye. Um, aye. Sorry. Aye. 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 We're going to do roll, roll call. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just to have the count. <laughs> Sylvia? Aye. Um, Maggie? Aye. Is Shannon a voting member? Yep. Yes. Shannon? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Tammy. Tammy. Aye. Sue. Aye. Did I get everybody that's online? Did you get Sylvia? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, then okay. you're good. Bill. Aye. 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 And I'm an aye. So it's unanimous. Um, all right. Uh, Act to approve the policy C-35. Can I have a motion? I move that the WRSVU um, act to adopt or adopt policy C-35, verification of student res residency for tuition payment policy and corresponding affidavit. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, all right. So. All those in favor say aye. I have Sylvia. Aye. Maggie. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Tammy. Aye. Sue. Aye. Rodney. Aye. Aye. Bill. Aye. And I'm it again. Kathy. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it is unanimous. The vote passes. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Policy Committee. Yeah. Thank you, all the communities for um, boards for approving it. Um, so, number nine, we're on to board development series. Okay. So, the, 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 the presentation was in the board uh, packet. Thank you, I don't know if it actually got put in the board packet. But we'll put it in there. It. Oh, it's, there were, it was linked in the, the email. Oh, it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Yep. Yep. It was linked in there. Um, so, so welcome to series number one um, of the integrated multi-tiered system of supports. Um, sometimes you'll see it say um, in other documents, systems of support. The S is in a different location um, but we have one system that has many supports mm -hmm. so we we um, as you know whatever valley supervisory move the s um, so that it fits kind of what power to the north <laughs> oh, like fits um fits our structure um, mm -hmm. and and what what we would like to see um, in our schools it's actually correct <laughs> so just so everyone knows um, we talked a little bit about this at the implementation team um, is made up of you know Onda Adams who's our chief academic officer myself Annette Rhodes director of special services and Michaela um, Martin who's the intensive programming system um, support coordinator um, so we work very very closely here 
at the supervisory union um, office, but also in our buildings, which you heard a little bit about um, already tonight. So just a little bit of history um, about Act 173, because it's actually been a long time coming. <laughs> um, so it was originally, um, you know, talked about and um, was supposed to be kind of disseminated out in the state of Vermont in 2016. Um, but what happened in 2016 was that the Agency of Education um, was directed to kind of work with some um, consulting firms to do some data collection of its own about kind of what currently is happening in the state of Vermont um, around um, service delivery, you know, for um, interventions at the targeted level and also um, at the special education level. So they um, were directed to kind of do some data digging um, and then kind of, um, based on what they found, um, come up with what they thought were best practices for the state of Vermont. Um, Can I just ask? Mm -hmm. um, is and you can also wait until later. Yeah, it's if okay. You need to, uh, was this something came down from the Fed saying you have to do this, or and then the state said why why would they <laughs> why would they stop the process? I guess and and then go back to the drawing board in a way. Do we know that? So stop the press start and stop. Well, the process. And it, it was supposed to be rolled out in 2016. Yeah, so well, they delayed it because folks were concerned about being able to implement it. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Like not having these structures we're talking about right. gotcha. in okay. place. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, as you as you learn, there's a lot of things we're talking about: teachers meeting in data teams, mm -hmm. distributive leadership, having early interventions and plans in place that provide intervention with fidelity prior to moving to a special ed eval. Mm -hmm. Like all those things needed to be in place in order to comply with the law. Okay. And really what they recognize is folks weren't ready yet. Okay. okay. Yeah, so what happened was, so, and it, and it took a while. I mean, it took a while for them to, I think, actually do the data digging um, and actually come up with reports. Um, there was two different com two different consulting companies. Um, actually, one of them was UVM, um, the University of Vermont, um, and then another one was called a di uh, district management group. Um, so they had those two um, different consulting companies that went and, and did the work. Um, and so yeah, so it was it was delayed. Like a rollout was delayed. Um, and then there was a, a revote, and the and the reports came out, and those can be found on the Vermont Agency um, of Education website, mm -hmm. um, and um, and it passed. So that's why it's called Act One Seventy Three of Two Thousand Eighteen, um, because they actually that's the year that they passed it. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a as a side note, the the interesting thing that I find as a director of special education is that everyone thinks that Act 173 of 2018 is a special ed initiative. It's not really. <laughs> um, it really talks about structures and systems that should be in place in schools universally as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, they just kind of came about it through the lens of special education and in and in my opinion i think it's because special education is kind of a law bearing you know federal um you know enforced uh section in education mm -hmm. and so if we kind of take that lens then everyone's going to have to follow through with it um, or make some changes um, in their structures that you know possibly the agency of education had been asking for schools to do for some time, but really wasn't getting the leverage that they needed. So this was a way to get some leverage. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, also just kind of what the act kind of changed. Um, they did some training for a couple of years, rolling it out. Um, but then in, in 2023, there's this financial restructuring um, that I've been talking about. I talked about it a little bit last year um, that's happening um, and then um, as of July of 2023, 2024, that school year, there's gonna be fully implemented new Vermont rules and regs for special education. And so somebody wanna know like, what is Act 173? 
And so really, it really just talks about, you know, providing students with equitable services, kind of the getting students what they need when they need it without any sort of delay. Um, that's what Act 173 is all about. It's supporting all students, um, not, not waiting um, until students are, you know, kind of that wait to fail model. Um, but getting them what they need when they need it right away. And so there's that special education, um, you know, financial shift. It was prior to to this in the in years past, more of a reimbursement model. So it was really all about the number of students in special education, which came from our child count reports, um, and then they would reimburse us. And it was also um, a, a formula based on what was called the Special Education Service Plan. Um, and that was a really long plan that um, we had to report, you know, how many special educators we had, how many related service providers, um, how many students, how many hours of services students were getting. Um, it was really, really um, detailed um, and really timely. But that's also what they would use um, as a way to talk about special education finance. Mm -hmm. But now it's shifted to this um, census block grant funding, which actually incorporates our ADM, um, but also a statewide um, salary um, average. So what are um, educators in Vermont on average receiving as part of their salary and our child count um, report numbers. And they have a formula um, that they have. Um, but then also the um, special education service plan uh, changed to what they call the Act 173 special education plan. Um, and it's much simpler. Um, all they're really asking for is um, the number of professional staff um, that we have and how many are we missing? <laughs> um, and then how many total do we have budgeted? So it's very, very simple because that's where they get the average. When they have the average of the total salary, they, they then use the number of professional staff that we have as part of that formula. So it's very, very simple. Question. Uh, yes. Um, salaries. Um, mm -hmm. You've got high salaries. Do you get more? Or if you get low salaries, you get less. It's the state average. So they take the average of, of all the salaries in the state of Vermont. Okay, and that's what that's the the, the financial aid we get. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then um, because it's now block um, grant funding, we need to do um, maintenance of effort reporting, um, similar to. Um, what Onda and Tara work together to do um, regarding like our ESSER funds and other grant um, funding that we receive. Um, I now have to work with Tara to, to do that um, mm -hmm. as a way to kind of account for the funds. So we're going to talk about our, our system of support you know, through kind of the special services, special education thread. Um, so starting July 1 of 2023, um, we're no longer going to use what was called um, this kind of discrepancy model is what it was called. And what that was is um, we would give some students um, some assessments around kind of their cognitive abilities, so their IQ, and then we would give them some assessments around their academic performance. So reading, writing, math, um, and then we would compare the two and their numbers. And if there was um, if there was a 1.5 or larger standard deviation between a student's IQ and how they performed academically, um, then they would then um, qualify um, under the category of a specific learning disability. That's what the SLD is, specific learning disability, um, in a basic skill area. So reading, writing, so math. 1.5 doesn't sound like a whole lot. It's not, it's not much. It's not much. I, I guess I would. But we're, like so what we're moving away from yeah. that. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. we're moving away from that to this is where um, 
we then weave in our multi-tiered system of supports. Um, so as of July 1, we're going to be using what's called uh, the multi-tiered system um, of support response to intervention. So um, what we need to do is, as part of our data teams and, um, and our targeted intensive mean teams, because we also want to weave in the social emotional component, um, is really look at students um, based on our universal assessments, provide them the intervention that matches what the data is telling us. So if they're showing that they need intervention and say reading comprehension, understanding what, what they're reading, then that's the intervention that we should be providing um, for the students. In, in a really research-based way um, that is also um, you know, effective and done in a way that is consistent with the way the program is designed to happen. And then what we do is then we progress monitor over time is how is the student responding to that intervention. Um, and if they are making kind of that, that, you know, when you look at data, if they're making that, that upward line um, in their data, so they're making the adequate progress, then that means they're responding to the intervention. The things, things are going great. Um, and so we should just continue, or maybe they don't need the intervention anymore. Um, and then they kind of rotate out. If they're not responding to the intervention, so you're kind of still seeing either a flat line or the, the line is kind of going in a downward, downward motion, they're not responding to the intervention. So we need to either adjust the intervention um, to kind of, you know, then fit what's going on, do some um, deeper di diagnostics um, to see even deeper kind of what, what else is happening there, um, and then do some adjustments then try some more, maybe different intervention based on that, the new data you collected. Again, check that progress monitoring, you know, rate of progress. Um, if they are not making the appropriate rate of progress, um, then we would pull together, you know, a team and kind of talk about, is there um, a specific learning disability happening here? Um, then, that, then that's deeper. So the why, why is the student not responding um, even though, you know, we've done some kind of larger, I call it more aerial view of their academic progress, then we went a little bit deeper with the diagnostics, we dug a little bit deeper under the surface, but we need to go even deeper Is, and kind of find out why they're not responding. So uh, uh, at what point, I guess, in this process is the child, I don't, I would, back in my day, special ed was take the child out of the classroom, give them special instruction and then put them back in the classroom after you've done the special instruction. Mm -hmm. Obviously, MTS is, is about keeping kids in the classroom as long as possible and seeing if you can adjust the specifics of how they're being educated among the group. Is really, the intervention could be done any way that is most meaningful oh. meaningful for the student. But still, so it's not just one way. So it's not, so, so at any time, it's not sort of like, okay, you failed the assessment, you're out of the classroom. No. That's the old way. Right. That's my way, or, you know, the way I grew up with. So you no, want we, to stay in there. We what? want them always receiving as them. universal instruction. Yes, gotcha. Okay. And they may get a double dip. So they may get, get reading, in the class and outside right. yeah, special. But not, mm -hmm. they're not removed from that no. universal instruction. And so it's, it's not, because it used to be getting the kid back into the classroom, you know, that that was the goal and on the regular schedule and that they're with everybody else. And now it's that they learn more either in the classroom or with double dips, as you say. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So um, just so the board is aware that MTSS RTI, which is the response to mm -hmm. um, intervention, is not new in Vermont. No. Um, we were first learned about it in 2014 mm -hmm. when um, the Agency of Education produced a field guide. That field guide was then revised in 2019. Mm -hmm. So um, those of us who have been in education for a little bit, um, we, we've really learned a lot about it and practiced and learned from our mistakes. So Jamie mentioned that um, there are components that we know work in schools um, that are effective that you need before you launch something like this. Mm -hmm. um, 
in July. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is um, educate um, through the website mm -hmm. and have um, certain documents housed there. So I wanted to make you aware of that, that under our new website design under departments, there is a section for um, uh, student support. And under there, it, there's a whole thing about MTSS. So the links at the top, Ray, I um, linked yeah. in the page that I was gonna show the board. So um, this is just an overview. Um, the idea is to help parents find information, um, especially as these changes come about. So on the left-hand side is really, what is MTSS? How do we define it? Um, and that talked a lot about it. It's a really a proactive approach yes. to getting students um, support all students. Um, and we do this through high quality universal instruction. And then we have different um, levels of support. We like to call them levels and um, not tiers um, because we want our system to be fluid. And then on the right hand side, you'll see this is the, um, the roadmap vision about what we hope our multi-tiered system of su supports um, encompasses um, around uh, um, how we support kids in um, White River Valley Supervisory Union. This statement also includes our emphasis on um, pathway, um, which I think is really important as we look to kids in middle high school on different ways of, of um, meeting their needs. Um, so that information is available on the website, and then we've created a parent guide at the bottom. I've got a couple of visuals to show you um, that talks about what it means to have universal instruction. That's all students. We want all mm. students receiving universal instruction <laughs> from their classroom teacher. Um, it, so it's not in replace of. So we're not going to be pulling kids out of their classroom to give them a different mm -hmm. version of what they're learning and reading. Every student gets access to that high quality instruction from their classroom teacher. And then, so that's all kids, and then some students may need what Jamie just called a double dip. So they, we would um, go into our teams and identify through a data point what that double dip is. Really specific. It's not just mm -hmm. reading. Are we talking about a foundational issue with students? Or are we talking about a comprehension issue? Mm -hmm. So we really do a lot of um, problem solving in those teams, and we include all professionals in those teams from the regular educator to the interventionist to the special educator. Principals at that meeting too. I could be there. Not. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I see that special education is all the way to the right. Yep. But I'm getting from what you're talking about and how you're going in. Left you right. actually start yes. left, left, and you're right. part yes. of all yes. of it. Okay. That's that's very informative because okay. you really do think of them as it's this thing. It's the it's the the kids outside the classroom yeah. that that's what you're doing, and that's really great to know. So you're about instructional education for everybody. Yes. Oh, That's great. So it's all some, and then few mm -hmm. is on the, um, as you go across mm -hmm. this, it gets mm -hmm. fewer and fewer students. Um, because the goal is if we're doing high quality instruction at the universal level, 80% mm -hmm. of our students will have their needs met. The universal then, level being in the classroom. In the classroom. Mm -hmm. the classroom te primary yes. teacher. Yep. 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 And then um, about 10% may need an extra support. And where our goal is to have very few students on the far right between mm -hmm. 1 and 5%. Which is what you've always said because it's expensive. So, right. Just getting them on. Yeah, and, the, and it means we're failing. Yeah. In a way, yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. So as that. we look at our budgets, um, we a lot of investment is at the classroom level because that's where we're going to get the mm -hmm. most um, investment um, payoff. Is at that because I was watching some things that recently around you know the COVID catch up. Well, we're not going to have enough interventionists, so we have to include everyone in this mm -hmm. process of supporting all kids. The team oh. effort. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is great. So that's right. on the website. Um, so if you walk away today and say, oh, what did she say? That's a good graphic. The, um, and we're also yeah, we're, really we're, we're putting, um, mm -hmm. we're um, pointing parents to this, as, as, especially as the special education is going to change or found referral. I would, I would put that graphic in a letter that yeah. goes home to parents. Yeah. I just think that's a really useful visual mm -hmm. that will help them understand this system in a way that I don't think I quite understood it until today. And I've been in this board now five, four years, ten years, I don't know how long. Um, but, <laughs> Never ends. Yeah. So here's uh, another visual as well. So we're trying to do different types of visuals based upon understanding. Um, and one of the things that we're really trying to emphasize within schools is this idea of being explicit and systemic around instruction, mm -hmm. um, especially at the universal level. So we've been working with schools around what does that, if we're going to have a systemic approach to reading, what does that look like in your school? Um, because it needs to be um, common. Um, because the language is really important and the approach is really important. So we've been working with schools around that. How are you using, sorry, how are you using the word explicit here? I don't know what that means. I mean, I know 
you're really clear about what you want to teach. Yeah, um, it, it's really focus. based upon outcomes at grade levels. So are we are we clear about what we want teachers to be able to know, understand, and be able to do with their students at the universal level, the targeted level, and the intensive? So these three levels need to be communicating with each other. And when the language is common, we're seeing students who then accelerate because it's all the same. So when I go to my universal instruction and I'm hearing this word, then I also hear it in maybe my targeted small group while well, I'm making the connection. I don't have to try to figure out what my, t what my small group is saying because my classroom teacher is saying something different. Mm -hmm. So working really hard um, in those core subject areas to really identify what those um, systemic approaches are in instruction. So that's where the PD comes in mm -hmm. that we've been working so hard mm -hmm. on. Um, and then as you move across, it gets more intense. Mm -hmm. It could mean it, it, the, the target is smaller. It could be more time. It could be less students. It just really is really student dependent mm -hmm. based upon their need. And the person delivering that instruction, it's based upon their expertise. Mm -hmm. So this, this, um, this act really opens up this idea of who is the most qualified to mm -hmm. be giving the most intensive instruction. It may not be a special educator. Right. It could be somebody else who's received more training. So it gives us that flexibility to be able to get students what they need at a faster rate than it was before. Mm -hmm. Reducing the need for um, more targeted intensive intervention as we move through the system because we know that if we don't catch it early, the gap will continue to widen and we'll need more and more. So that, that's what we're really focused on right now. And that flexibility in who can provide the intervention actually um, is part of that financial change also. It, you know, it used to be that only special educators could work with, you know, students who, you know, were serviced, you know, via an individual education plan, an IEP. You know, they might be able to, you know, um, help do some intervention with maybe one other student, um, but we were really locked into kind of what we used to call silos, right? Like mm -hmm. this was special education, this was general that's, education. Yeah, that's what I um, and and there that is no longer. Mm -hmm. I, I always do hand motions. It's blended now. <laughs> yes, it's a blend, and it's really about who's the most highly qualified person to provide that research-based instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, most special educators are generalists. Um, you know, they come having a lot of knowledge about a lot of areas. Um, and so uh, last year I started providing really kind of specialized um, PD, you know, for people asking people to kind of identify kind of a passion area, um, whether it be reading, math, or social emotional, and really kind of even um, with support staff paraeducators, I ask them the same question. Um, and so we're really hyper focusing on. Um, kind of very specific skill areas so that, you know, more and more people are getting highly qualified or even getting the opportunity to attend really high quality professional development, even if they're a paraeducator. Um, because like I said before, at this point, all hands are on deck to support all students. If I can just add again, it's, uh, um, it's bringing back lots of memories for me. The great thing about keeping them in the classroom is that there is absolutely a stigma to being pulled out of the classroom and being put in a special group or whatever or individual and that you're not doing other things and you feel dumb. Mm -hmm. At least I certainly did at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like, I like the idea that you know everything you're trying to do is keeping you in that room with your peers, working along with them. It's, it's really good social emotional. Yes, mm -hmm. yes absolutely. So kind of doing more of a thread. So again, this is as of July 1st, 2023. So when a student, um, you know, a team, a family, um, family is part of the team. So parent guardian involvements um, in a team is crucial right from the beginning. Um, way back, you know, kind of at that universal level after we, you know, give universal assessments. Um, a family is, is just crucial as part of a team member. But when the team, uh, special education evaluation planning team comes together, um, they'll be looking at these kind of five um, key elements as part of their discussion um, because we need to rule these out before we can move forward um, with qualification um, for a specific learning disability. 
now in the state of Vermont. Instead of just comparing a couple of numbers together, now we are actually diving really deep and looking way back at the universal level to make sure students got what they needed when they needed it and not waiting. So the first question is, um, you know, a lack of adequate achievement in one of the basic skills after receiving high quality universal instruction. So, you know, did they get high quality universal instruction? So that's way back in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, did students get what they need to access their education? Yes or no, basically, is, is, the, is an answer. Um, demonstrates a lack of progress when provided with scientific research-based interventions. So that's back to uh, the targeted level when they, you know, have a targeted intervention plan and the, the team's kind of building a learner profile about what does the student need, what are the diagnostics showing us, how are they responding to the intervention by progress monitoring. So it's a lot of data review and looking at what data is showing you and telling you. Um, so the next one, you know, not a result of exclusionary factors. So if you are suspecting that a student has an intellectual disability, um, and that's kind of um, having real cognitive challenges, um, you got to rule that out. Is a student having some serious emotional, um, you know, kind of moments, kind of that social emotional piece? Is that blocking their access um, to their education? Um, you need to rule out, does the student have a visual impairment um, or blindness? Is, is the student having difficulty hearing? Um, is hearing part of you know, why they're not being able to access and make progress in their education? Um, is there an orthopedic impairment? Um, cultural factors. So if um, you know, a student um, has you know, comes from a different culture than, than us or the family practices different cultures than we do. Is that causing, um, you know, that lack of adequate progress, you know, that, that we're hoping for? And also just kind of other environmental or economic disadvantages. So, you know, is the student missing a lot of school because of things happening in life, um, you know, um, are they not able to complete assignments at home just because of things happening at home? We have to rule those out. Um, and also we need to do some observations, um, which, you know, are really important. Um, and then also here's that parental piece again. We need to make sure that parents have been notified of, you know, the process from the beginning um, and that they're active participants, um, you know, in the process and in the progress um, of their child. So it's really talking more about the student as a learner and what I call putting together like a learner profile and not just giving them two assessments or three assessments that can take all day and you're just comparing digits. Mm -hmm. You're really getting to know the student and the family, um, which I just think is wonderful. So he, um, the last slide is really about what's all the um, things that happen behind the scenes <clears throat> to get us mm -hmm. ready because there's yeah. this is not as Annette said, it's, it's more than just special education. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that has to happen around um, universal. Um, so we've talked a lot about the team structures that we have um, implemented in schools, both academic and social emotional. That is happening in all schools um, as mm -hmm. of today. And we're monitoring those when we meet with principals. Yeah. Um, that we're prog we have a schedule set up, a calendar of how we're going to progress monitor students, how are we going to check to know whether or not the intervention and the universal instruction is helping with appropriate rate of growth. Um, those will happen um, starting in November after, once we um, look at TMP. Um, I don't know if everyone knows this, but um, we are revising um, proficiency-based graduation requirements at White River High School with a partnership um, with the Vermont Agency of Education. We're part of a research study with them. They're partnering with us um, because one of the, the, the key things that has to happen is we have to know what the ends are for kids. Um, and that starts at the high school and we'll, we'll be moving backwards from that, creating um, and revising clearly articulated curriculum with grade level outcomes in grades K through eight. Um, K8 focus this or K5 focus this year will be math and reading. We're, hoped, we're hopeful to get um, all content done in K, uh, six, eight because of the high school work, but that is something that um, has to be really um, articulated for not only teachers and students, but also for families. Um, so that will be go on the website as well. 
Um, that will be a multi-year process around identifying your ends, but then also what does it, what does the curriculum look like at each grade level, mm -hmm. so that families know what's happening in classrooms and how that relates to the report card. All of that work is being done, and then really building um, staff expertise um, on early release days through coordinated professional development, but also at the um, staff meeting level. Um, oftentimes we're asked to come out and present something. I was in Newton this afternoon, this afternoon at their staff meeting talking about a reading assessment that um, I'm going to be helping them with. So it's, it's really working with principals to develop this PD plan so that we're ready and a multi-year plan mm -hmm. of how we're going to use investments to be there. Cool. Any questions, comments <coughs> regarding Series one. <laughs> Thank you for your report. It was really informative. No, I really appreciate you. it. It was great. No, I just one request. Um, is there a way you could provide that hard copy? Either I tried to print sure. off your slides and got nowhere. Okay. It might be sure. me, but if I think some of us might want to be able to go back to that. Sure. Yeah, it's an excellent presentation, so there's a lot there. Thank you so much. Awesome. Anybody have any questions? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right. Okay, we're on to number 10, discussion items. It's Onda. Um, <clears throat> this is Onda. Yep. Um, WRVS, you continue this improvement plan, Onda. Yes, hi. So we looked at this uh, at our last meeting. Um, we got some feedback from board members around um, helping to think about how to align it even more closely to the work that um, we have in our strategic plan. Um, so we have added an additional goal um, that um, aligns to our strategic plan. So the wording and the um, and the strategies and the measures should all be really familiar to you all from that work we've done uh, over the last year. Um, but there was a request that it be part of this plan, which we submit to the State Agency of Education uh, as part of um, our work uh, or as part of the, you know, our agreement for receiving federal funds for the title funds and the work that we're doing that they, um, that they keep an eye on. So this, uh, the first two goals remain the same. Um, and then the, the additional goal is the third one at the, probably at the bottom of, uh, probably the next page. So. Page three. <clears throat> Thank you for expanding the academic yes. achievement measures. I appreciate that very, very much because uh, we're doing so much in that, that area and <coughs> to try to achieve uh, those results we're all wishing for. The one comment I have for, I think I speak for every board member that, because uh, you don't need it, but I think we do. If you could you just use a footnote like we've got um, page one, all caps, SWIS data. Um, um, Ethan, do you want me to t you want to tell us what that is? I don't have a clue. And then we have YRBS data. So whenever you have, yeah. uh, if you just a, you either put glossary. parentheses and spell it out or, or, just or footnote a glossary it or something. At the bottom, yeah. it, it, um, uh, I think that would give us some sense, uh, help our learning curve. It's not a big deal, but it's. Uh, but thank you. Okay. Do, you, do, you, do you want those defined now or just in the future? I, I'm, I don't want to uh, uh, bog this down, um, but it's just a general uh, it's always, help for board members. Yeah, it's always, um, uh, when we get we home, about uh, we can answer our, our wife or our husband's or partner's uh, questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's, like, a good, it's a good push. We try to, try to sort of take well, care of all of those. If it's a public document, too, if that's the goal of it, is that it's a public public document that we hope people will read, then we want to make sure they don't get stopped by something they don't understand, yeah. an acronym. <clears throat> so yeah, a footnote or glossary, I think you're absolutely right, Bill. All right, so Anda, are you looking for us to approve this tonight? Uh, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. yeah. So. Uh, make a motion. Goes in here. Uh, uh, make a motion that the WRVSU approve the continuous improvement plan. Is this a particular draft that no, we need to just do? as presented? Okay. As presented. Okay. Right, second. Seconded by Bill. Is there any discussion before I call the vote? All right. Oh.
All right, so hearing no discussion, I will call the vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. I will start with Sylvia. Aye. Shannon. Aye. Um, see the names. Tammy. Tammy. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Maggie. Aye. Sue. Aye. Ethan. Aye. Rodney. Aye. Phil. Aye. Kathy is an aye. So it unanimously passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Um, 10.2 is draft one of the WRBSU 23-24 budget. That would be Tara. I'll start and then Tara will jump in. Okay. That's what we discussed. Terry, you good with that? So, programmatically, um, within the SU budget, you'll see that that in general, on the fiscal finance, uh, technology, uh, universal instruction, that we're really looking to stay status quo in there. Other than we're we're still looking to continue to move our work forward in regards to curriculum development, proficiency-based learning, things of that nature. And so what you'll see is, is that that budget is up slightly, but it is up in a sense of there's no added FTE to that, to that budget, okay? And so those are just anticipated costs. Um, Healthcare, et cetera. Yeah work that we need to do around some contracted service to help support this work that we're doing. We're also trying this budget, um, some of the contracted service work that we've been able to receive in the past, we've been able to leverage ESSER. We believe that we're gonna still need some of that work around PD and support around our system. So there's some funds that are in there for that as well. Um, so you'll see that it's, it's up 3.6%. Um, and then, well, again, there's not like we we are not requesting additional FTEs or anything in that part of the budget. So what we'll talk to you about is is like we do typically at the local district budget is where there could be some changes in FTE. And what you'll see here is that we are looking to increase by 1.0 special educator for next year within the budget, and that is found on page two of five. Um, and but you're gonna see a decrease in paraprofessional salary line. And so we are looking to decrease um, within the, our paraprofessionals. And I think that was a, like a one, is that what it was? Um, and, but we are looking to increase, so by three paraprofessionals, Which we're looking, one? it's on page two of five under special ed teacher salaries. I have two of four. There's the SU budget and then there's the special I moved budget. on to the special ed budget. Ah, oh, that's why. Okay, sorry. I didn't hear that part. Nope, that's all right. There wasn't any changes in FTE. Mm -hmm. We typically do, and I apologize that that didn't happen. You're used to usually seeing those. But that's why I wanted to point them out. And we'll make certain you have that next time. So it's page two of five. Yeah, no, I see it. So you'll see that... The teacher salaries are up, support staff salaries down. That is because we're looking to add one more FTE for special education, specifically supporting students um, that may need some intensive uh, supports at the secondary level in programming, um, thinking like students who are in that three to 5% who could have what we call um, real serious challenges with intellectual disability. Um, and we talked about trying to partner with CVSU last year, if you remember, to try to build some programming in that regard. Mm -hmm. We're right now budgeting for another FTE to help us do that within our own high school, which will serve students with those profiles across the SU, mm -hmm. just like our high school alternative programming serves students across the SU right now. They enroll in our high school and we serve them within our alternative classroom. That's part of why you'll see special ed budget down is that we continue to see our contracted services decrease around needing to tuition students out of district. And in a minute, I'll let Annette give you a sense of how many students we've been able to bring back um, within district by doing this work. The other thing that's still on the docket is, is that Annette and I are gonna meet November 11th 
um, I think it's the 11th, with our my colleagues within Winooski Valley Supervisory Union, so uh, the the collaborative. So from <coughs> Lamoille North, so think Johnson, down to us. There's a up and down the 89 corridor. There's uh, it's called Winooski Valley, and superintendents like Montpelier, Washington Central, when you think U32, Spalding and Barry, Central Vermont Supervisory Union, who we were trying to partner with last year, Randolph. We're looking as there are ways to regionally better support our kids in a more efficient way. This is still a demographic within RSU that I believe and Annette believes we're struggling with. Mm-hmm. Meeting, stu- meeting students' needs where they're at if they need real intensive interventions and supports at that middle high school level, which is what we talked to you about last year. Mm-hmm. We were hopeful for that agreement to come through. It didn't. We're budging a special educator to start at this point to start building that now in the event that this regional aspect doesn't come through. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What you will see, and I mentioned this to some of you in local district meetings, is part of why we are able to get down to 35 uh, support staff paraprofessionals is that as we look to implement earlier interventions and supports mm-hmm. and intensive behavioral plans, that's happening before a student would qualify for special ed. Right. Yep. So think about the presentation you just saw. Mm-hmm. We may need paraprofessionals now to implement behavioral <clears throat> plans or intensive supports before qualifying a special ed. So some of you in your local districts, you have seen regular ed paras go up. The reasoning for that is, is that sometimes we need regular ed paras to help implement intensive plans, mm-hmm. especially when you think about grades K through three. And mm-hmm. right now we continue to see if you said socially, emotionally, where are you seeing a lot of need? Mm-hmm. Definitely at our primary levels. Yes. And I would say that's an area where COVID has really hit. Mm-hmm. The pandemic has really hit our students, mm-hmm. is that our students in those primary grades, just lack of exposure, lack of opportunity to have social time with um, peers, we're seeing that impact our kids. Um, and so, those early interventions we would look to try to implement through our MTSS prior to them qualifying for special ed. So in some of you, you will see an FTE or two. <coughs> Rudd has, uh, we're, we're suggesting three more additional pairs there in that regular ed budget. But that's, that's the adjustment there. Um, the overall bottom line of the special ed budget is down 1.65%. So when you look at your assessments across special ed and the rest of the fiscal services, technology, curriculum, my office. Overall, the two budgets we're presenting you tonight are down when you combine them. The one position that we did not put in this budget currently because we wanted to kind of get a feel of the board is we have been wrestling with this idea of a 504 case manager for the SU. And what a 504 case manager would do, I'm going to let Annette talk to you about right now. That is an area where I want you to hear about it. I just kind of want to get a feel of it and see if the board would support this idea of us to look to add that position within the SU budget. Right now, special educators are case managing 504 plans. And you may say, well, what's the reason for that? Part of the reason for that is that we were doing it differently in every building, and I was becoming increasingly concerned about our buildings being out of compliance around 504 case management in federal regulation. So I'll let Annette just briefly talk to you about the numbers and what we're seeing around 504 across the SU. Sure, thank you. Um, So, yeah, so Jeannie's, uh, you know, fears of being out of compliance um, is very, it was very true um, when we started to, um, you know, really dig deeper and, um, trying to figure and some buildings weren't even sure what what (coughs) students um were being serviced through a 504 plan um some 504 plans that we we received um were were almost two plus years out of date um so that means we were definitely way out of compliance um and so um, the special ed- education department um, has been doing, spending a tremendous amount of time really trying to clean it up, um, find students, contact parents, 
um, to have kind of those those conversations, um, trying to find student plans. Um, and because we have a lot of, of students with student choice, um, we also have to be um, the LEA or you know the legal you know educational representative um, for those students as well. Um, mm -hmm. So trying to keep track of right now we have students in seventeen different schools outside of nice our nice. supervisory union. I counted them today because it was brought up at our monitoring okay. um, meeting, so I was able to go and count them today between middle schools and high schools. Mm -hmm. We have students in 17 different schools outside um, of our supervisory union. Um, and so we need to keep track of those as well. Um, and the number of students uh, being serviced or, or qualifying um, for a 504 plan um, is quite high. I think more than what um, we all had expected. It's definitely higher than what I had expected. Um, we are over a hundred students, um, you know, qualifying, and just with the the pandemic in general, um, students are receiving uh, diagnoses um, more and more um, through their pediatricians or um, you know other related service providers like psychologists or therapists, which then we need to then discuss, you know, is that diagnosis impacting a life, um, a life uh, ability in education is one of those, um, you know, for that student. And if it is, um, then that student then will qualify for a 504 plan, which includes um, some services and accommodations for them to be able to access their education based on their disability or their diagnosis. Um, and so those numbers are rising. They're rising nationally. Um, but, you know, just here in our supervisory union, those, those numbers are rising as well. Ethan. Uh, two questions. Does a 504 necessarily cost us more money? A 504 plan falls under your general education mm -hmm. budget. Okay. It's um, the American Disabilities Act. It mm -hmm. falls under that. So there isn't any specific like grant funding or other um, financial source with that. That is just, it is, it is the school's responsibility um, to provide them access to their school in their education based on their diagnosis so and their could, disability. Could definitely cost us yes. some more money. Yeah. Yes. One way to, yeah, it could one way to think of it is essentially we would be looking to provide targeted or mm -hmm. intensive supports, yeah. mm -hmm. but there's not a funding stream tied to it. But we right. can use our title funds to support academic interventionists mm -hmm. who may serve that student just like they would serve any other student who doesn't qualify for intervention via 504. Right. Mm -hmm. Second question is, mm -hmm. would this position, and I, maybe it's too soon to ask this, but mm -hmm. sounds like we've got a process to get in compliance. Would we oh, then need a full-time officer? Do you think you could handle it once we were in full of compl uh, compliance? Um, no, because out of what I'm coming across is out of the 17 schools um, that our students are attending outside of our supervisory union, mm -hmm. they all do things differently. And I can't tell them how to do it so that it matches our system. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it's, I'm trying to like teach people how it's done in different buildings. Um, and, and I've been having a lot of pushback and I've been working really hard with um, some of our sending schools to kind of work it out, make deals, like let's kind of come up with how are we, how are we working together um, you know, to make sure students get, get what they need. You say we're responsible for these students. I mean, does that mean, obviously we're paying their tuition, mm -hmm. but does that, do we have a financial burden as well for that student when they're in that school that we may oh okay we may it again this is the service oh yeah okay yeah okay yeah depending if they need if they need a equipment or whatever the service okay. is okay mm -hmm. yeah that is interesting i did not know that before yeah or like a paraprofessional right mm -hmm. would be an example right. we would pay we would have to pay for yeah that. the district it's interesting why but there you go. well there are students right 
And we're and still the LEA. Yeah, we're still the LEA. LEA but so, Ethan, just an example, one, one, um, one school district that a lot of our schools attend, that district says, oh, you want to attend meetings? Great, we'll invite you. But we'll, they say, we'll take care of everything, oh, right? Yeah. But then you go to another school district, and they don't want to be responsible for anything, they don't want to be responsible for holding and facilitating the meeting, paying for any of the equipment and materials. So I'm kind of working with like this, this spectrum of um, you know people's uh, their own kind of personal district schools you know uh, responses. And I've been working with with our legal with Dina Atwood um, to kind of help me walk through it and how to navigate um, with some of the schools that, um, you know, really want to be hands off. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's, you know, one person um, kind of coordinating, uh, it would just be a lot easier because that person will know the system and know each building. Um, and it would just bring some consistency because uh, right now it's kind of it's over it's overwhelming. Um, overwhelming our system um, as we're trying to have our special educators be interventionists for all students um, and take on this on top of it. Um, it's just, it's adding. Um, and just so everyone knows, our numbers are higher than expected. Um, so the number of students that each special educator is responsible for is higher than expected just because we had a lot of move-ins <laughs> um you know which is fantastic for the white river valley supervisory union um but it just um it just increased and um, really thinned out our, our system <clears throat> so i think the, the question for the board really is are you supportive of us looking to add that fte so you can at least see what that would do to the overall bottom line budget for next month I would say yes. Yeah, I'd support. I would say yes to look at it. I, Maybe I would. This is Maddie. I, I, I was just listening to what sounds like a really overwhelming situation, and I'm sure there's a lot to uh, unpack there in terms of the different way approaches or the lack of what sounds like accountability from the different schools. Uh, and I wonder, is is one case manager, uh, uh, like, is that going to do adequate? <laughs> if you have 100 people in school, all different school districts doing something different and a more cases than you expected, is that, you know, just a piece of duct tape on the, you know, on a crack in the, in the, in the dike, and I don't, I'm just wondering if that's the appropriate thing or if we should be looking at two or I'm just being ridiculous because I don't, I'm naive about the process. No, thank you, Maggie. That's a good, a good point. And I think um, what I can come back with when we, um, if the board, you know, wants to um, explore what, what that would look like um, more, I can come back with more solid numbers and, um, Possibly what the case manager might do is um, is really kind of coordinate the 17 schools that are outside of our supervisory union. Um, and I can give you um, bigger, deeper n numbers of what that of what those look like, um, just so then um, it breaks it down a little bit more. This is Sylvia. So if you're looking at the um, person, the 504 coordinator as going looking at the 17 schools outside the district, who would do the ones for the schools within the district? If I take, if I take, again, I'll look at the numbers, but if I take those numbers off <coughs> the, our current special educators plate, it might be more manageable. Um, so our special educators would continue um, to be the case manager slash meeting facilitator for students that are within our supervisory union buildings. How would that work to make sure that all the schools within the supervisor union are managing it the same way? The coordinator could oversee that to make sure that it's done the same way. And that, that's what we're doing right, right now, now, Sylvia. Yeah. 
is our, yeah. our special educators are managing it, but on top of that, some of them are managing students who are at the high school level, even though they're an elementary special educator, because they serve that district. Right. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you alone at the White River Valley High School, there are more students um, served via a 504 plan than there are students served via an individual education plan. Um, so that alone is, is really, is really eye-opening. Um, mm -hmm. And those numbers are just increasing. All right, so I say, can I just get a quick thumbs up that we agree to let them take it back and come back with some more concrete numbers um, next month? All right, anybody opposed to that? <coughs> That'd be a thumb down. That'd be a thumb, That'd be a thumb down. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kate Jarvis raised her hand. We're gonna have another public comment. Um, Kate, we're gonna have another public comment coming up here very shortly. So can I? I'll catch you then. <clears throat> it's board goals. Board goals. Um, We had a, a good warm retreat. It is getting warm. Thursday. I, can, I feel like um, I'm getting warm. They made me shut off the AC. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, it's, it feels a little stifling in here. Yeah, I'll put the AC on. I don't want my AC, but no, I, I just no, I like see. fresh air. That's cool. And for all that could not make it to our board retreat, it was a very good board retreat. We had a lot of um, good conversations. We had a yep. trivia game. I think uh, Blue took away the winner with the candy at the end, but it was a good icebreaker. Um, a great way for board members to, to take the opportunity to get to know each other, and we had some really good discussion and ideas come out of the meeting. Well, and just to see meet some board members face to face for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, well, it just makes a big difference to know who you're really talking to. Um, uh, and there were several things we talked about, some of which are in our goals, um, that we would like for initiatives that the goal that the board take on. Um, two things. So what happened is we sort of had a brainstorm session uh, among the members who were there, board members who were there, and came up with these uh, seven sort of goals. And then I, I typed them up, and then Andrew um, uh, put together sort of uh, my brain is getting tired at the end of the day. Um, sort of direct action, I'll call them, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, for several of these um, so that we can really say, yes, we did that when we get to the end of our year. Um, uh, we present this to sort of your input. Um, <clears throat> I think... Yeah, we don't have sort of specific goals for number seven. And number seven is one that brings up some really good conversation. Um, and I think the key word I would like to point out to you is viable uh, in that sentence. We're not saying that at any point, you know, some hackles start to go up where we start to say, hey, what about, you know, focusing on our, our <clears throat> high school being the flagship high school. And it's, and it's like, no, 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 you know, people like their choice. It's not that. It's that we realize that a lot of students, even students, uh, middle, uh, elementary and middle school students, who are very close to the, our, our main high, our one high school, um, aren't even considering it as a viable option. And that we felt it was a good goal to, to bring it up to and, and to think about that as an SU, at an SU level, not just at the, okay, that's the high school's problem. No, it's part of our SU. It's a build a program we want to strengthen, and that we want it to be on, ideally, every family's list of a potential school as a viable option for them. They may go somewhere else, obviously, for many, many reasons. But uh, uh, and I, I think that's the one area we probably don't have as a board. Obviously, as Andrew shared with us at the retreat, the um, the high school board, and it's the White River, is it the White River High School? I, I never quite get it right. Is that correct? White River Valley, WR, WRV, HS, 
Thank you. Um, that they have goals that they're very aware of and a new principle, and that they're working hard toward, you know, um, bringing, bringing their program up. Um, but so I think that would be one specific area that we could think about where we have specific goals that we can attain as the board to support them, whether, and I really don't know what those would be. We, we couldn't come up with those at the time. So, you know, maybe seven isn't something we keep on. Maybe it is. Uh, I, I like it. At least something to think about. So um, I don't know if, if we feel these are good as they are, we can move to accept them. If there are suggestions, we can certainly go back and um, Andrew and I being a committee of two uh, can can uh, do a little more work on them. But I guess we'd like to know if, if you've all had a chance to look at them. It's not a long read. Uh, what, what your preference is. And Andrew, yeah, do you have any comments to support this as well? Uh, I'm oh. finish up a couple of them. This is uh, Sorry? Like a finished draft, so like one F, you know, when I was going through. Oh, I see. Goals. So goal one was all about how do we support the superintendent with his goals and looking at, you know, what actions for each of those superintendent goals the board would take to support um, or could take to help support the superintendent with his goals. And I just you know, had to come up with something good for one F. Um, which was about um, improving the SU's reputation through communication and whatnot. I think there is something the board can do to help with that. Um, so I just didn't have the words at the time. Oh, yeah, help um, I didn't notice that. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other one that I think we talked about at the, um, at the retreat, creating the board mentoring program, yeah. And so I think what we should have in our goals is what we'd like to, um, you know, I don't want to put in like what the board mentoring program would be, but we're going to start a process to create board mentoring programs, what we'd, we'd like to get out of that process. Mm -hmm. you know, clearly a list of potential mentors, you know, do we want to provide instructions for how to be a mentor or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think it's something that we could t take back and speak to our individual boards about Great. Um, and come back with some feedback. We could send the feedback um, to either of us yeah, and we can bring you Andrew. back a revised draft. We could bring back a final draft. Yep. Um, but this felt like a really good document to have for the board. Absolutely. It sets us on a path. It's a checklist. Yeah. It's a nice a way to, you know, we can look at the end of the year. When we're after we've evaluated Jamie, we can sort of say, "Hey, how'd we do?" Which is always Bill's big thing, accountability. Yeah, I was gonna. I really like this, um, and you did it in one page. So I, that always uh, thrills me as somebody that, in business school, always appreciated being able to write a short memo rather than a term paper. That's mm -hmm. got me through graduate school. But anyway, I think. Um, it would be helpful that on the back page we have a copy of our superintendent schools for this year because it's in more detail. And I think we can't lose focus with that detail because there's just a lot of huge things in there like developing a capital plan. We don't talk about that specifically, we talk about it generally. Mm -hmm. So if, if we have in the back as a reference tool, um, we can have it available to each board member as we go through the year. That would be my suggestion. Is there any comments or questions on this document? Or and are, are we good with taking it back to each of our boards, um, giving feedback to Ethan or Andrew, um, and then we'll come back with hopefully a final copy that we can adopt in November? Thumbs up. Can I get a thumbs up if that's, that's a <laughs> solid plan of action for everyone? Okay. Good. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. Sure. Um, I really appreciate the work you've done. Um, Hours. Hours. After hearing about all your work, it makes it. It makes it kind of small. Makes it in. <laughs> um, so comment. I'm going to do. I know some people came <coughs> on after our first public comment, um, so I didn't want to exclude anybody who po popped on and, was, and had a public comment um, to the board tonight. So I'll just go through the people that we have on one more time and see if you have public comment. 
Um, so, so Kate Jarvis, I know you you raised your hand. Um, if you would like Hi to. There. Hi. I'm sorry you were going late. I was taking the kids up from a school field trip and the um, soccer playoff game. Ah, no but worries. I'm a I just had a couple of questions for clarification after listening to the meeting. <coughs> so I'm just curious, um, how many do we know how many students are currently being switched out for the 17 other schools? Do we have a count from our district as a whole? Interesting. Is that SU as a whole? Yes. Yeah, so <coughs> if I can jump in, Kate, as far as tuition out, that is. I can tell you how many students leave our SU and don't attend our high school, but as an SU, all but one member district have school choice at some point, whether it's middle high school and or um, like Granville Hancock has complete school choice. So that's, I guess that's another one of my questions for Superintendent Kennedy is, I guess if you could provide clarity as to our current school choice policy, so I would, and, and I can email you or you can email me to provide clarity, but I am curious as to our numbers of who is currently switching out to other schools number-wise and then what the policy is if, if parents are to choose to send their kids to other schools. What is the policy? I speak to this real quick. So I think there is a little bit sure. of confusion about what these tuition numbers are. These are for special education students that we can't serve in our own district. Mm -hmm. no. 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 Okay. No. All right. No. So, so we have we have students. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I got confused. Yeah. No matter. Do you want to answer it then, Andrew, or, or no? <laughs> no. Um, so just real quick, and, and Kate, I'm more than happy to go into more detail around it. Within our su I, wasn't, I wasn't asking about special education. Yeah, no, around supervisory, around the supervisory union, we have a school choice district in Stratford. They operate a K-8 district, and students for, in grades 9 through 12 get to have school choice, and they can attend any public school within Vermont, also bordering public schools in New Hampshire, and then any independent school that is accredited by the Agency of Education. And that and the district would pay up to the state average. This is the same for any of our school choice districts. Sharon is a pre-K-6 district. They tuition out students seven through 12. We have First Branch Unified District. They are a K-8 district. They tuition out students nine through 12. Rochester Stockbridge Unified District is a pre-K-6 district. They tuition out students seven through 12. And then we have Granville Hancock Unified District, which serves students in pre-K through 12. And all of their students have school choice. And then we have the White River Unified District, which serves students pre-K 12. Students within the White River Unified District in grades 9 through 12 can participate in Winooski Valley School Choice, which means that they can attend other public high schools <laughs> through an application process that comes out of the guidance department every year and so a certain number that they're limited to? the board can cap that number we have never come close to having students request to the number yeah. that's capped you have a cap number, i believe it was 10 the last two years and then where do we get the list of other of all the schools that they're going. That list goes out in the application packet. Okay, and where do we access that? School, that? That comes out through the guidance department. I believe it's right around every December 1st of January. Yeah, January. And yeah. the, that, is, that is done through Win Winooski Valley School Choice and is coordinated out of the Washington Central Supervisory Union. Thank you. And I think the only other question Regarding the 504 plan, there was a comment made that there are currently more students being served by a 504 plan, and I, I didn't quite understand it. It was a little fast. Is that at the White River Valley Middle School or High School? At the high and school. And then if you could just repeat the comment, was that, you know, yeah. it was a, could you repeat that? I don't yeah, so it's, it's, it's so that we... we currently right now, and when we look at case management caseloads, we have more students 
receiving services via 504 plan versus an individual educational plan. So that's alarming, right? No. No, not really. No, I wouldn't I would say no. I think it it really looks at like if we can provide services for students even if they have a disability and it's not reaching that 1.5 standard deviation, then that could be an example where a student could get services via 504 plan versus an IEP. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, Andrew, who else do we got? Uh, Patty McClavain, hopefully I said that correctly. Do you have any comments for the board? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Simon Pod. He was on earlier. Um, all right, hearing none. Is there anybody else on? There's an unknown caller on. If you have a comment, um, just let us know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for public for showing up and doing all the work we're doing. No we have a new hire. Terry, you want to talk about the new hire? Oh, yeah. We are happy to announce that Jane Prescott started with us on Monday. She lives in South Stratford and was a referral from one of our board members, which we are grateful for. So her title with us is Payroll Accounting Clerk. So we've started her off um, in her first two days on um, getting right into the weeds of our FY22 audit. So it's so far, she's having a great time and doing a great job. So we're really excited to have her join our team. It's amazing the people in the county. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Tara. I'm really glad to be more on, Well, no, for, the, for me, not Is for there them. any other business for the board tonight? Mm, no. Um, yeah, future agenda items, things we need to add on. We, we have our actual- We'll go look at the goals again. Yep. Uh, well, well, hopefully, have and we're gonna, something from the flag. And every, we'll be bringing around and talking about volunteers for the mentoring program to each of the boards. So hopefully, we can have a we'll have a, group a put together discussion for that. and a discussion about what it should look like too, yep. maybe with the board. Yep. So we'll talk more about the mentoring program. Draft two of your budget. Draft two of the budget. Yep. Draft two of the budget. <clears throat> um, our next meeting date is Tuesday, November twenty second. Um, and beyond that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, so moved. Thank you, everybody. See you next month.